in this series, we've tried to conceptualize and also discuss, uh, you know, post-COVID scenarios, because this is an unprecedented situation for all of us. Uh, and of course, the world, the pandemic has impacted uh, every aspect of our lives. And, uh, uh, you know, what uh, the scholars have been uh, telling us, uh, I've read a few books on pandemics in the past, uh, one of them is by a man called Frank M. Snowden, who is a professor of medical history at Yale. But uh, what uh, what uh, these books tell us is that, uh, uh, you know, pandemics have affected human uh, history and human society even more than wars. Uh, and unfortunately, yeah. our memories are so short that, that we forget, yeah. you know, the Black Plague, the White Plague, and the smallpox epidemics, and... Uh, and so on and so forth. And we just return to uh, life as normal as soon as perhaps a vaccine come, comes out or uh, whatever, uh, uh, you know, ways that we invent to combat this terrible epidemic. Now, uh, one of the things that uh, the research shows is that the most vulnerable sections are also the most affected by the pandemic. So uh, when it comes to India, obviously, you know, our migrant laborers have been terribly impacted. And yeah. uh, also women, uh, women who are a very vulnerable section, as you know more than I do, you've been the national, uh, the chairman of the National Commission for Women. I'll, I'll come to uh, an introduction in a moment, but I mean, our vulnerable sections are going to be the most impacted because uh, we know that during the pandemic, domestic abuse, tensions, uh, and uh, also uh, the difficulties that our women face. For example, in Haryana, I was reading, and in Punjab, that uh, as soon as the liquor vents were opened up and the relaxations were brought in mm. after lockdown phase two, the women began to complain that the men don't go and work, but they, whatever money there is in the house, they'll go to the yeah. liquor vent. And so uh, what we're saying is that uh, what is the status and, and position of women during the pandemic and what can we do about it afterwards and of course i would request you also it's customary for us every year to flag certain issues trying to maintain good practices in our office we have an internal complaints committee also and we are committed to uh, an environment in the institute where all our women employees feel safe they feel uh, secure they feel protected but more than that they also, luckily, we haven't had many instances of uh, of this kind of uh, harassment on the workplace, in the workplace. But the point is, they also feel free to talk about uh, issues that concern them, you know. And we have a mechanism in place. So uh, uh, I've invited uh, uh, Dr. Minu Agarwal, our resident medical officer, uh, okay. once I finish and introduce you to sort of conduct the proceedings partly because you know i might uh, face uh, pockets where the wireless may go off you know i'm connected yeah. with my phone so i apologize in advance for that and also that uh, our paid subscription somehow hasn't kicked in of webex <laughs> every 50 minutes we'll get cut off but yeah i know there's, I no, restriction. there's no restriction to how long you can speak lalita ji it's it's no, no, that's it. your flow so uh, after the first 50 minutes, we'll just log on immediately. So, yeah. uh, uh, so I mean, it can be a nice uh, two-minute break for whatever uh, nature calls or whatever we need to do. But I, I just wanted to say a couple of words about you. Your... Okay, uh, you he's getting... You need to switch positions. You've even stood for elections. And now, of course, you are a director in India Foundation, one of the most influential foundations in India, and uh, I've had the privilege of speaking in the same panel with you. On many occasions, you've chaired the panel that I've spoken in. But I think our readers, I mean our listeners rather than readers, don't really know one of the most interesting things that I've, I've found about you, which is in your blood courses, you know, the political uh, cross-currents of India. I can't think of any <laughs> single party where one member or the other of your very, very distinguished family hasn't played a huge role from uh, the communists on the left. Now you're a member of the BJP. 
a justice party, a Congress party, and all kinds of parties in between, uh, some member or the other of your family, starting with your uh, distinguished grandfather, have, have been very important to, to the entire political spectrum of India. So we are very proud and happy to welcome you to Thank our you. webinar series. So over to you, Lalita Ji. And after this, if in case I have to switch off my, my video, I'll still be here, I'll still be listening to you, and the Armo will, will uh, take over from here. Uh, uh, Minuji, do you want to say a couple of words before I request uh, Lalita Ji to, to address us? Do you want to say a few words, uh, Dr. Agarwal? Okay, sir. Good afternoon. I'm just uh, Good afternoon. a brief introduction to uh, uh, Madam uh, Lalita Kumar Mangala. So, if you permit me, to, so I can read out a few. Sure, uh, of course. So, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome, uh, Ms. Lalita Kumar Mangala, to this uh, webinar series of challenges and opportunities in India post COVID 19 world. So just a brief introduction. Uh, Madam Lalita Kumar Manglam was chairperson, uh, National Commission for Women from 2014 to 2017. She has extensive experience in working towards the empowerment and advancement of women from vulnerable and underprivileged sections of society. She has worked on a range of issues such as healthcare and HIV AIDS prevention, sex workers, and the LGBT community, migrant and construction workers, and uh, self-help groups, and urban slum women. Uh, Ms. Kumar Mangalam has a master's degree in business administration from Bronx University and graduated with honors in economics from St. Stephen College, Delhi. So with these words, I invite uh, Madam Kumar Mangalam to start the yeah, thank you very much to both of you, Makarant and you. Um, let me plunge straight into the topic that I was asked to speak on. Now, uh, we all know that COVID has upset lives generally for everybody, men, women, children across the board. Uh, we all know that millions of uh, people have had to go home. Uh, the migrant labor amongst them, many, many of them are women and children. We also know that even though uh, you know, the government has opened up many governments, including state governments and the central government. There are still major barriers that we have, we have to cross with regard to COVID infection. Uh, Indians do not have a good record when it comes to civic sensibilities or the way we behave in public. And too many of us are not following precautions. Uh, the rising tide of COVID infections does not reassure anybody, either internationally or people who understand that epidemics uh, can leave very, very deep scars on societies, both economically, culturally, and of course, politically. Uh, on the, we also have a lot of, this country has a lot of other problems at the moment, and I don't think it's just restricted to India. But let me speak about what has happened to Indian women and children, the majority of them, during the last seven to eight months, say, uh, since the lockdown. Uh, because that's when the real effects of the epidemic started to be felt. Now, there are many anecdotal evidences that violence against women, especially domestic violence against women, has increased. However, the unfortunate uh, fact also is that reporting of violence has actually gone down. If you take the statistics of the Home Ministry, you will see that reported domestic violence in the last quarter of 2019-20, which includes March, really, basically. And the first two, uh, the first quarter and the next two months, so, uh, say the, uh, the first six months of 2020-21, there has been a reported decrease in domestic violence cases. However, this is, I mean, people don't understand that statistics don't always, in many um circumstances don't always show the reality of what is happening. The major reason for the drop in the uh, reported violence is because women, A, you know, uh, you're sitting at home with the person who is the perpetrator of that violence, the man who's actually beating you up or whoever else is uh, abusing you in other ways. You're also, uh, many women uh, don't have the, the physical space. You have to take your phone to be, go and make a call or to complain about it. 
and you can't uh, actually, you know, if you live in a small house, people can hear what you're talking on the phone. You can't be whispering. Three, if you manage to somehow after lockdown is over, a partial lockdown is over, manage to get yourself 10 minutes and go to a police station. The police are too busy with patrolling uh, whatever they have to do uh, to prevent COVID. Uh, they are out on the streets seeing people, whether people are wearing masks or not. In many parts of the country, police are, their hands are tied because of the floods, because of various other natural calamities that have hit the country almost simultaneously. The third thing also is that domestic violence itself is not considered such a big issue in this country even today. Um, when you go to even in Tamil Nadu, which is the state where I come from, uh, you know, uh, it is considered one of the better managed, better administered in many ways, industrially much more forward, better educated people, etc., etc. state. Even there, if you go, and I'll say it in Hindi because I know the language, they will tell you, Are ye to gharelu mamla hai, gharm ja ke karo na, abhi COVID chal raha hai, hamara aur koi kaam hai kya? You know, this is a very, very common refrain I've heard from women. And a woman or even a child, any human being who has been abused, Physically, mentally, uh, physical abuse almost always leads to a mental uh, trauma in the uh, in the person who has been abused. When they go to a police station and they think, okay, finally, maybe I'll get some help. And the reaction is this. Then it totally uh, sends them off, uh, you know, off uh, their balance. It just pushes them off balance. And they close in and they just say, okay, thieke, jo hona hai hoga bhi, and they go back home. Also, the abusers and the women during lockdown, you can't get out of the house. Don't forget that. So where do you go and complain? There, there is no All India number where, you know, there is for rapes, but for domestic violence, there isn't. Now, let me quote an example that France had done. They had come out with a number where women could call local pharmacies. It was like a code number, say 789. Okay, or DV123, something like that. I don't know what the exact number is, uh, but they would call a pharmacy and the pharmacy could then inform a local police station. Now, uh, while many of, me, uh, many of me and my friends who are also activists said that this would be a good idea, the problem in India is that most of the people who man our pharmacies are not really either well-educated or well-trained enough or even well-oriented enough to understand that domestic violence can actually uh, upset fi families very badly during a lockdown. In a lockdown, you're stuck at home. While many people have connected with families, we've heard very good stories and all of that. In a family where a woman is being abused, it is not a happy situation. Women also tend to, um, tend to protect their children, all women across the world. And when uh, a man is frustrated, a man's income has dropped, or let's not say that always the abuser may not be a man. It could be an older woman. It could be a younger woman abusing an older uh, woman. It, the abuser generally has more power. And they are frustrated at this moment because there's a drop in income. You are stuck together for 24 hours. In Everybody's tempers tend to get uh, upset more easily. And women who are abused and feel that their children are at risk will always protect their child first. So children are also getting very badly affected. And you know what happens to mothers when their children are at risk. The average mother, Indian or anywhere else in the world, will always put their child first. And often that gets them into more physical uh, trouble uh, and makes them the victims of greater violence <coughs> than when they can, say, go out of the house, go to a neighbor's house. Or just, you know, uh, said, push the husband out of the house. Whatever. They, there are very limited options for women who are the victims of domestic violence during a lockdown. Now, the other thing is that in public, in the past, many women who are abused have had access to safe spaces where they can go to sit and talk to other women who have been abused, to talk to counselors, to meet doctors, you know, to, uh, to negotiate or to uh, get strengthened in order to be able to deal with such a situation. Even these are not available during a lockdown. So the, the fact is that not only is she a victim of violence, she's stuck in a place from where she cannot escape that violence, even if she wants to. Now look at the other side. Let us look at another aspect of how violence 
uh, is very difficult to deal with, especially during, has been very difficult for women to deal with during the pandemic. Many women who are sitting at home have lost their jobs. Women who had a degree of, independ uh, of economic independence, women who even if they did not have economic independence, at least uh, that chapa is there that I know, that I contribute to the house. Now, even that has gone. Here, statistics have shown that 73% of women who have lost, 73% uh, of people who have lost jobs, especially in the unorganized sector, are women. Now, let us also remember that most women work in the unorganized sector. Women like me or Dr. Um, Minu or many of you fellows who may be on uh, listening to me now, we are the rarity. We are less than 5% of the total population of India's women. Um, we don't have, uh, I mean, we have the liberty of falling back perhaps on savings, uh, of having our own uh, self-respect, of being able to negotiate a safer, uh, less violent life for ourselves. But the majority of women do not have this option. Now, during the, the, the uh, pandemic, I'm sure that eventually uh, the figures that will come out about even sexual abuse will be much, much more than we presume. Now that the economy has started opening up, uh, uh, Makaranji mentioned one point that many women have been saying, and this was a complaint again that came in from Andhra Pradesh and Tamil Nadu, the southern states and Bihar a lot. The moment alcohol shops were opened, you know, we could see even in Delhi, people will go and stand in line for hours just to buy booze. And everybody knows that alcohol exacerbates many feelings, right? It pushes you to lose your temper fast. It makes you more violent. Uh, it makes you get more angry. There are lots of reasons for it. And one of the excuses, and I'm using this word deliberately excuses. Some people may feel that I'm being prejudiced against men. But one of the excuses being given is that the frustrations of sitting at home have made men lose their tempers and take it out on their wives. Now, I'd like to point out two things here in defense of other women that everybody is sitting at home, men, women, children. It does not give only men the right to lose their tempers and take it out on their family, especially their wives and their children, wives or other women in the family and their children. This is not right. This is what I say when I say that civic sense in India can be very, very poor. Now, when we've opened up and we also see that when women get infected, the entire household gets infected, uh, um, affected. All right. If a woman is positive in an average household, let's take it where a woman does her own cooking and does a large part of her own housework uh, during this time because our maids were not turning up, the whole house gets badly affected. And the, the, the sense of guilt that is put on the woman that, look, I mean, who asked you to get infected? You know, it's not a choice women make, to, uh, any woman makes to get sick. Many women I've heard have been covering up that they're not keeping too well, which is actually uh, medically very wrong. But I don't know whether one can actually blame an individual woman because I don't know her circumstances, her family circumstances. I don't know whether she's caught in a trap of, uh, you know, not having enough money to be able to go for treatment or doesn't want to be uh, targeted, to be stigmatized. You know how, uh, how easily we, how judgmental we Indians can be. Somebody says, I, I need to go to a psychiatrist. Achha, wo to pagal hai. Hmm. A woman says, Ki mujhe COVID mil gaya, immediately. Where did you go? Why did you go? Whom did you go with? Etc. 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 So the stigma uh, that is associated with COVID also has put many women in jeopardy of increased physical violence. Now let me move to another topic where women also have been adversely affected during the epidemic. Health seeking behavior and nutrition. There is a baby boom which has already started to be reported post the COVID uh, lockdown. Now, this has happened, I think, uh, if you look at, if there are historical figures available, you will find every lockdown uh, there because families are forced into close, uh, men and women are generally forced into closer contact with each other. There has always been a baby boom. Now, many women don't even understand they're pregnant till, I mean, it's too late. And the, the fact is that in India, traditionally, Reproductive health services are not that well available. I'm not talking about abortion. I'm talking about the prevention. I mean, prevent a woman being able to prevent herself from getting pregnant. 
most of our our um, uh, family health centers should be able to offer them contraception but women don't have that that behavior is very very poor through in with women throughout india especially the women in the lower economic um, communities where more children per family are actually born now when money is in a shortage actually if traditionally if you see in many houses even very very rich households it's the women who eat last they serve food they make sure everybody else eats then they eat now when you're in a well-off family you should be able to get enough uh, money uh, food to be able to uh, nutritious food it's not the quantity i'm here i'm talking about the nutritious aspect of the food that you may get but from in poor families you get just the remnants and this also compromises women's health making them more susceptible to any infection immunity is always adversely affected by uh, food that is not nutritious enough women themselves from birth are taught that you eat last that you cannot complain about the fact that your food is not nutritious enough and this is something hello can you all hear me hello all right i i presume that you all can hear me so I yes should... yes we, we can hear you okay even i can hear you in the okay. car so i'm sure others can okay, go good, ahead good, go ahead good 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 yeah thank you so when women themselves feel that there's nothing wrong in us being fed last there's nothing wrong if we eat the remnants of what is left then it's very difficult to change that situation and you know it's a generational problem that occurs again across the world but in india especially when a woman's health is compromised during a pregnancy the child's health is also compromised both in utero that is when she is pregnant and after the child is born because especially now that breastfeeding has been made so important it is even i have sometimes commented that i'm surprised to see how poor women get pregnant and actually manage to produce their babies much more than you know uh, women who are educated and who live in cities a friend of mine pointed out it could be the cleaner air and the cleaner vegetables and the less polluted uh, places that they live in whatever the reason for it the fact is that when a child's nutrition is compromised in that first six to nine months and we are now saying uh, that six months breastfeeding only breastfeeding doctors say don't even give water and uh, if the mother's health is compromised the child's health is compromised and a child's brain gets its maximum growth in that first 10 months and then from the 10th to the 24th month in the first two years of the life about 90 percent of your brains i mean the amount that it should really grow already grow it should have done it if it doesn't in a sense you are in many ways you're not uh, mentally compromised but perhaps uh, more often than not a child's mental um, the the growth of its brain can be uh, adversely affected most often is perhaps not measured scientifically too much but the fact remains that it's very very important now the fact also is that schools have been closed for over six months i have a granddaughter of seven years and i know how irritating it is when the child is sitting at home for it is not the child's fault children are demanding they want to go out to play they want to talk to their friends they want to be able to use the net to do whatever they want to do and mothers are the ones who normally carry the burden of the household running the household is normally a woman's job uh, in india this is i mean whatever we may say however an empowered women may be i have friends who are you know extraordinarily successful entrepreneurs but still running the household is her responsibility she may have the money and the education and the training to be able to multitask and all of that but it is her responsibility and during the epidemic most women have unfortunately uh had this added responsibility of having children sitting at home especially young children children up to the age of 12 standard i think even colleges are not open right and young children need a lot of all children need attention but at least when they're a little older it's about just providing food but younger children need a lot of physical care too so the physical burden on women has also increased and you know we can't complain about it there are many empathetic places, like I said, safe places we could go to. But 90% of women, other women will also be critical of a, of a woman if she turns around and says, Are ba pray, my children are at home, it is such a burden. You know, it is very difficult for women to come out and express themselves in a way where they are not judged 
uh, in a very critical manner. So they keep quiet. And that builds up a lot more uh, um, uh, mental and physical tension. The amount of tension that women have gone through in COVID, I don't think women have even started talking about it. Today, I spoke to a very old friend of mine who's actually the, he the head of the Gildo service. Um, the titular head she is in, but executively she runs the place and that's a huge NGO. And, uh, you know, she was telling me about women across the board in India who are now coming and saying that, please get us, uh, you know, get us somebody whom we can just talk to. We can unburden ourselves to. Now that shows the amount of stress they're under. They're not even able to talk about it. How many of us do you think, uh, you know, can actually go and tell a sister or, or you know, uh, somebody else, a sister-in-law, or anybody, a neighbor, that, you know, this is happening to me. The old Indian uh, sense of, you know, ghar ke bahar nahi jana chahiye, that is, we don't talk about our troubles outside our four walls, is also hemming us in. Now, the fact also is that women, when women fall ill, they are the last ones to be taken for treatment, generally. And this is exacerbated during the epidemic. Because if anybody is ill in a family, again, most of the care burden falls on the woman. If it's a wife or a daughter-in-law or an elder daughter or whatever, it's the women who normally do most of the caregiving. Health insurance for women is very poor in India. Very, very poor. Uh, when I had treatment for cancer, I was, at that time, that was the last few months of my tenure at the NCW. So I was covered by government insurance. But post that, the moment I went, and because I, I tend to tell everybody very frankly that, you know, I went and told my insurer that I have had treatment for breast cancer and this is this, this, this. You should have seen the reaction from them. They said, wait, and this is a very big insurer. They said, madam, let us see, let us see. You see, you are already almost, you are almost a, a senior citizen. I said, no, almost is not the point. Under the law, you, either you are or you aren't. So you look at your alternatives and get back to me and tell me what I am to do. It was extraordinarily difficult. Imagine when you're sitting in the chair of the national of the chairperson of the National Commission for Women, if you have to really negotiate your own health insurance, what the ordinary woman is actually going through. Now, uh, coming to from all of this, let me come now back to uh, what uh, Makaranji also talked about post COVID. What do we need to do for women? First, we need to, and every government, regardless of state, whether it's a panchayat level, whether it's the district, whether it's at the state level or the, the central level, you need to get women on board to tell you what were the problems to face uh, they faced, how these problems, in case of another epidemic, again, like Makaranji said, there have been many epidemics, but we never seem to learn from them. We just, uh, once everything is, we think is back to normal, we just go back to behaving normally. I mean, take it, uh, and look at it now. How many people in public are actually wearing a mask? The proper way around, the mask is down here. What's the point of wearing a mask? How many people are continuing to wash their hands or have sanitizer with them? Look at the, the, the television series that have come back on, whether in Hindi or the, or the other regional languages. You will find that nobody is wearing a mask. When they go out, it's like Nam Ke Vaste, as we say, just a name. So, in such a case, you need to actually talk to women to ask them what do they need in both a lockdown or a similar situation or when life is limping back to normal. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, one thing that most women will tell you is that they must have safe spaces that they could access during such times. Where perhaps they, if they physically cannot go and visit it, they could at least talk to somebody who can help them through what they are, you know, help them to get over the worst or to deal with the worst of what is going through, what is hitting them. The loss in income, the loss of a job, the loss of privacy, the loss of, uh, the, you know, the, the safety that uh, the husband has gone to work and will come back and is not just going and sitting in an alcohol shop and is going to get, come home drunk and beat me up. There are many, many things. Women will also tell you automatically. It's the women who will tell you that the children need this, this, this. Post-COVID, one of the things that many women have told us about is, for God's sake, bring in a policy where every, much like uh, we have said that, you know, um, sexual, uh, the um, uh, uh, Prevention of Sexual Harassment at the Workplace Act, 
is there, bring in an act that says that everybody who has more than five or whatever number of employees must have a crash. Again, when I was chairperson of NCW, I had a crash built. And I was told that only one girl has a child who will leave the, uh, who, I mean, we have only one employee who has a, a small child who's not going to school who needs to be left in the crash. So I had to tell them that the point is not whether it's one or hundred. Every woman has the right to have a choice to leave her child in a crash. If you're lucky enough to have elders in the house and you have enough money to be able to afford a caregiver like a nurse or an ayah, then that's a different question. But if you don't have that option, it is it must be made the duty of the employer. Now, whether the government chooses to subsidize, etc., how they do it, that's up to the government. But women will tell you that we need safe spaces for our children, which means caregivers for the children. Crash is used is a word used only for very small children. But today you have uh, children who are, I have heard girls being abused uh, uh, between the ages of about 8 to 12, 15. And it's not all sexual abuse. A large part of it is physical abuse. Because in our houses, our Indian tradition is to train the child from the age of 5 or 6 or 7 or 8. A girl will be told, jao, matlab, pani le jao papa ke liye. Hmm? Uh, jara istri kar lo. We are taught housework, for want of a better term. I'm not judging good, bad, all that. That's I'm just placing facts now before you. It's up, for, up to you all to judge what should be actually done. You know, uh, if you all remember Prime Minister Modi ji in his first Independence Day speech on August 15, uh, 2014, he said that we, we question our girls, we never question our boys. In the lockdown, this has sort of been exacerbated. I have been told by many people, I don't want to name names and there's no point in it, that, you see, the male child always gets more attention, better food, more freedom to use, whether it's the net or the... <coughs> or to watch television and girls are told what Apni maa ki ja ke help karo. this itself according to me is a huge step backward indian girls today you just give them you know in tamil we say tuli that is one little bit of opportunity and they are shining whether they are from a, 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 a very big home a rich man's home or whether they are from a little chawl or they are even from the slums our daughters are so strong and so resilient that we, they are, if you actually ask me, post-COVID, it's the women who will be able to bring this country back to normal, even economically. The big factory is fine. You have men working there, few women. But there are facts which most people, statistics which most people don't bother to even really look at properly. Agriculture. Over 70% of agricultural labor is women today in India. What women don't have is the titles of the patta. The patta is not in their name, therefore there are problems. But that's a different topic. That's about how agricultural women need a, a, um, facilitation from the government. You look at art and craft. That is textiles. Um, all the uh, toy making that again Modiji spoke about. Most of the toy making. You look at uh, hand looms. Increasingly, most of these are being uh, man, for want of a better word, most of the workers there are women. And these women do not have health insurance. What happens when they fall sick? These Many of them are daily labor. If not, they are marginal labor. Their wages are not really uh, even minimum wage that is prescribed today by most of the governments in uh, uh, state governments and central government of India. So what happens when they lose that income? The economy has started picking up. But things like clothes, things like um, to toys, of course, will be somewhere down the line. Art and craft, food, yes. But it's again, when it comes to agriculture, women are not the people who actually handle the cash. Most of the cash transactions are done by men. But today, because of the Jandhan accounts, millions of women have benefited because that 500 has gone straight into their accounts. Even then, what has happened is that many women have told me that because everybody knows we have got money, we are the ones who have had to bear the financial burden of uh, dal roti sabji. And we have limited money. These are things that, this is what I'm saying, the statistics have not yet come out on these. And I doubt if we ever really have, uh, uh, India has not, does not have a history of what we call disaggregated data. That means data specific to women. 
not just data on number of women uh, who are born or number of women who are educated, etc., but much more minute data that are just not there in India, even before, well before COVID. So forget about it being there during the time of COVID. Also, when you have women who work, uh, for example, the bureaucracy hasn't lost their jobs. We have a lot of women in the bureaucracy now, in the police, in many other places, informal jobs, in the formal sector, all right? The percentage of them may be much less than what is there in the informal sector. These women also have had many problems. Many women have been laid off. Uh, the only two sectors that have really done well during the COVID lockdown across the world is, of course, e-commerce and in India, agriculture. These are, as we now say, the shining stars of the COVID epidemic. And how anything can be shining during COVID, I don't know. But this is that's being used. Even in those sectors, women have been laid off much more than men. Why? Because women themselves often have said that it's okay, let my husband work. I will take, a, you know, a short holiday or a hiatus, or I will for now sit at home for six months or do my work over the net. Voluntarily, many women have said that because they are, uh, some many women feel that it is better that we sit at home than the husbands. If we are at home, we can do both the home, uh, look after the house and do our own work. Men are not traditionally trained to do housework and take the, uh, responsibility of seeing that the household keeps running. It's not just about cooking and cleaning when your children are at home. There are a lot more than that. Women are also the ones who normally sit with their children when they are um, bring their homework back, back from school. And today it's not just homework. Everything is on the net. Schools are opening, but it's on the net. So most women, uh, you have a problem when women are not as literate as you and me, who can help our children to do their work and their homework. What is happening is that uh, women are not able to take that burden. And again, they're getting into trouble, which normally is either being harassed uh, physically or really physically abused. Women will tell you that there are problems with uh, continuing school online because many women, uh, you know, what I was taught, which is 40, 50 years ago, that's not the way our grandchildren are being taught today. The system of education, the way maths is being taught is totally different today. So if you're a woman who's over 30 or 40, you'll find that the maths that your child is, is learning, sometimes it's very difficult for us to explain to them. And there are practical problems like this that have abounded, that have come out through the epidemic and are now even there present as we are slowly opening up. Um, you would have been told that suddenly in the middle, the price of onions had shot up. Now, you know what happens when onion price shows up. Onion is just almost like rice and wheat and dal. It's a staple diet in this country. Except for a very few marginal population, most people eat onion as a normal thing as part of their diet every day, even the very poor. So again, when it comes to not provision of food that one wants, you take it out generally on the women in your house, your mother generally or if it's not her your mother your bhabi your uh, your uh, your masi or chachi whatever i mean i really don't know but it is the women who have taken this burden too today yes the onion problem fortunately was solved very quickly and the prices are back to normal but nonetheless as women see the opening up of the economy many of them are very afraid that they will not get back their jobs and given the fact that most families have been financially hit negatively, most families, and you know, women may have saved, Indian women are known to save a little money here and there, buy a little gold here and there, etc. But in the lockdown, that hasn't really helped them. Maybe the cash may have if they could use it without their husband knowing. Maybe women who have access to a bank account that you could use a net, uh, the net to do your transactions. But how many women, how many percentage? 1.36 billion, 48.67% or so are women. Do the math. You just can't have you know enough women who have that sort of option available to them. Now, this is what the government needs to take on board, whether it is the Niti Aayog or the ministries or uh, you know any of the states who are looking at uh, what women actually need, actually what the economy needs. In Maharashtra, you have women in the rural areas because Maharashtra is one of the only states in uh, mid and north India that has taken up the self-help group concept and pushed it as much as it was pushed in South India. 
So women there actually are rearing goats. They have trained themselves to be local veterinarians as referral veterinarians, the ones at the ground, at, at the grassroots level, who can go if there's a complaint and go and see what's wrong with the cow, why she's not giving milk. Only if the child, if they don't know enough medical, uh, you know, uh, medical veterinary medicine, then they call the local vet. So they are part now of what's called the supply chain. But in the COVID again, they have been stuck at home. It's very difficult for them to travel. Now, when they do travel, they have to first take care of the fact that their children are at home or the fact that their husbands are also at home. Imagine how uh, rare it is in India that a woman actually goes out to work when the husband is sitting at home. In most, uh, in most, uh, uh, I would say 95% of cases. So the psychological effect of COVID on women has not even been considered in most cases. For women like me who have grown up children, um, my maids disappeared. But you know, I come from an economic and a background where I was able to cope. And I was, uh, I've, I've never been the victim of uh, physical violence. I'm one of those women, if I was hit, would have probably hit somebody back. But aside from that, at my age, uh, it's a different attitude that I have. I come from a family where uh, Makarand has mentioned all the men, but my grandmother was the first woman and the only woman from South India to go to the round table conference in 1932. Recently, a cousin of mine was rummaging through old photographs. He took a photograph and sent it. And I put a Facebook post saying, this is one of the best things of the women in my family. We've never, not really been taught to doubt ourselves too much. So we don't. Now, that is a confidence that very, very few women in this country have. Very few women will tell you that I am a breast cancer patient with as much confidence as I do. Because I don't care what other people think. I know what I went through. I know that I had the strength to go through it. I was lucky. I was saying that uh, most women don't have that option. And now tell us a little the... more about your grandmother who went to the round table conference <laughs> in 1932. Yeah, actually, I don't think too many people are interested in that. Makarand, I'll tell you that when I see you. Okay. But the fact is that um, most women do not have that ability to, or the self-confidence, to be able to say that I really don't care what other people say about me. Some of it comes with age, yes. But... Uh, uh, you know, if you if you come to a meeting of the various Kumara Mangalam daughters, and there are many of us, there are some eight or ten of us, almost all of us have done extremely well in the work, uh, in whatever field of work we have been in. And uh, whether it is teaching, whether it is in the bureaucracy, whether it is me who has uh, been an activist, uh, um, uh, I mean, they say lots of things. Uh, nowadays, there are all different terms, which are sometimes quite foreign to me. Um, influencer, etc., etc. Uh not that we have not had our problems, but we've always had the self-confidence to be able to deal with those problems. Sometimes uh, not always the way we wanted to, but we have had the resilience because we've had uh, been taught that, you know, you can do it. Don't doubt yourself so much. So whenever people ask me to give me a pep talk, that's the one thing I say to girls, so don't doubt yourself. Say that you're going to do it and you'll get there. Maybe there will be hurdles along the way, fine. But most women in India do not have this option. And this is something that the government must be able to provide. Today, after a very long time, you have a prime minister who talks about sanitary towels from the Red Fort. Women don't talk about sanitary towels. Forget about men. It's you know, when, when, uh, when I heard him say this, I literally clapped. I was so happy. Because uh, how, many, how many men, how many women talk about sanitary towels in public? I mean, seriously, how many women, how many of us actually will talk about sanity towels in public? He spoke about something as stigmatized and as hidden sort of as that from the, you know, from when he was raising the national flag or immediately after that. And this is the time when we need to take advantage of a prime minister like that. He brought in triple talaq, the bill. I have worked with Muslim women who have had hell because of triple talaq politically whatever may be said at the grassroots it's a different story in 2019 when modi ji won people asked me Ki ye triple talaq bill ka kya fayda hua? and i told them that you know women are not going to tell you they voted for him but a lot of muslim women did because they had an option made available to them 
from a man who may not have, uh, you know, may not have a family of his own or, a, or, you know, that sort of thing, but who understands that women have their own needs and those needs to be addressed. Uh, those needs must be addressed. So this is a time where uh, influencers, you know, people who take decisions, including people like Makaran, many of us, we need to make sure that the, the, the fact that women must be taken on board when you're making programs for post-COVID recovery. Financially, uh, um, partly because Nirmala Ji is a woman and a woman from a humble background who has risen through her sheer competence and hard work to where she is today, understands that there are women's issues that need to be addressed. So she, as far as she can, I'm sure she does it which is why we had that uh, Jamdan thing where 500 rupees were sent to women and still being sent, will be sent, I think, uh, for a couple of more months. Giving many women a little elasticity with regard to how they can uh, tackle the problems that have hit them during the epidemic. But much, much more needs to be done. This baby boom that I was talking about, you know, uh, it's it's not the figures are not going to come out and open. Uh, people will be very embarrassed to say that we've suddenly produced babies in the last 10 or 11 months. But the truth is that this boom is going to take place throughout the world. It's not just India. And we need to be able to deal with it. The portion program that Smriti Irani ji just, I think she even tweeted about it yesterday, is something that needs to take this into cognizance. You have to take into account that many more babies are going to be produced suddenly over the next few months. Which means that reproductive health for the mother, uh, nutrition for the mother and the child, all of this are going to have to, they will have to be made uh, a part of the planning for a post-COVID economy. Again, women and jobs. We have to look at the, the, you know, the jobs that could be given to, if not all, and we can't do it all, I have to agree to that, but as many women as possible to empower them or to facilitate them if they can't go back to agriculture for example uh, actually no that's a wrong example because like i said agriculture is one of the only two sectors that has done well during covid and has actually grown in india but uh, all the other un a marginal uh, um, daily wages the women um, we don't yet have enough trains for our maids to come back from whether it's jharkhand or uh, Assam or, you know, wherever else they're coming from, Bihar, etc. Those women need to be facilitated. Mm. Uh, you need to be able to say that we are willing to provide training, that little bit of extra skilling that women may need to be able to re-engage themselves economically. Uh, we need to be able to put out, it's called information, education, communication in uh, the world of uh, uh, when you do activism with people at the grassroots. That is publicity, literally, like what was done for polio, like what was done for many other things. Uh, uh, in the environment, how much work is being done on the environment through TV channels, through everybody. The government of India has a habit, not just government of India, the governments of India, state and center, has had an old habit. This is, I mean, I think there from the time independence was, uh, was won by us where we put out advertisements saying this is the work we've done not advertisements saying this needs to be done except take swachh bharat and what a success that program has been yes we had a remarkable man in parameshwar Rayer who dealt with it, a bureaucrat who was really a wonderful um, implementer but there are other parameshwar Nayers in the government and the government needs to now come out and say that if there is violence, tell us what we need to do to help you. Much like what happened uh, post Nirbhaya, where we responded to the need of women. The governments need to take into account the, uh, the fact that women need to get back their jobs. Over a period of time, of course, nothing happens overnight, immediately. For example, now the new law that was just passed yesterday, I'm told it's a controversial law, though I don't know why, but that's the politics of it. Uh, the agricultural law where poor farmers couldn't sell anywhere. Again, there are a lot more farmer producer co cooperatives or farmer producer uh, organizations as they are called, which will be, which will find it easier to navigate this new law than individual farmers. And many farmers, as I said, are women, not just labor. 
many of the men have migrated. If you go to uh, Uttarakhand, you go to Bihar, you go to anywhere, you'll find Kerala, even down south. This is not just a Bimaru state's problem. You will find that most of the men have uh, um, um, uh, moved away to the cities, migrated to the cities. And many women are still left behind, whatever the reason for it may be. And they will be the ones who will be doing agricultural labor or sex work. These are the two easiest options available for women when they are left behind the villages and the men have gone to the towns to work. Now, you need to be able to prevent both. We need to be able to facilitate women to see that they don't are they not pushed into sex work or uh, labor where they are not paid enough or paid uh, regularly and the government has to look into it. We have to take the planning down right down to the grassroots. Just sitting with the big bureaucrats in AC rooms or people like me or Makarand or many of us who may be here is not enough. You need to go down, right down. We have now 13 lakh women in our panchayats in India because of reservation. And out of these 13 lakhs, believe me when I tell you that there are at least three to four lakh women who are tough, competent women. Not all of them are somebody's wives and daughters, etc. And many of those wives and daughters themselves have now understood the power of being a panchayat member or panchayat chairman and have learned that I can use this power to do something for my children, to do something for the school, to do something for women to, uh, you know, for women's lives to be a little easier. Here again, it is a fact, and this is a statistical fact, that men like to invest in big ticket programs, big roads, big infrastructure. Women will say, no, the school needs a schoolyard. So these women who are now at the panchayat level, we need to take them on board. That is up the line from a level at the grassroots Women need to be consulted. Women's voices need to be taken on board. This, according to me, is the single most important thing that the government of India and state governments and all bureaucracy across India, regardless, it doesn't matter what caste, creed, party, vagera, vagera, must do. Because this is a golden opportunity that we have also got. In a way, we are starting afresh. And this afresh must take into account all the facilities that women have not been given, not just during COVID, but before that. As Makaran said when he started off, I'm sorry, I'm not calling you Makaranji, I should. But as Professor Paranjpai said, when he started off, we must learn yes. from the lessons of the COVID epidemic. Not just say Ki, these are the problems and yeah, we need to deal with it. We need to say this is how we deal with it and this is how we must deal with it. And scholars like you, who are at I, 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 oh God, okay, at the Indian Institute of uh, uh, Administrative <laughs> Studies in Shimla, IIAS, are people whose voices are heard. So please make sure that your voices are actually heard. I'm sorry, uh, that's my dog that's barking. One sec. It's up to us to make sure that these voices are heard, that they are taken into account, and that it's not just a naam ke vaste hearing. That women's voices, uh, when heard, we listen to them, and we uh, we uh, adapt our policies to make sure that their needs and their desires and their demands are taken into account and are actually uh, uh, taken on board. And women are facilitated so that in case, and God forbid, another epidemic like this hits, uh, at least they are better protected, not just physically from violence, but also economically uh, from uh, much of what has happened to them. Also to change women's behavior themselves, to make them uh, more responsible towards themselves. To understand that if I don't take care of myself, my family is also going to suffer. And therefore, I should take care of myself. Not to feel guilty about that. To give more women the opportunity to get the skills they need. Not only for life, uh, you know, to making uh, for life skills, but also the economic, the financial, the internet, the negotiation skills they need to be able to have better lives. Now, I think I have spoken for long enough, nearing, nearing an hour. 
So uh, I was told that uh, questions, comments, etc., are also allowed. So thank you very much for the opportunity, and please feel free to comment and question, and please suggest also. I'm not, I'm, I'm not too old to learn, so please, uh, if you have suggestions, etc., I'd be very happy to hear them. Thank, thank you, you thank much. you, thank you, Lalita ji. Uh, before I call the RMO once again into the conversation, mm -hmm. I wanted to uh, simply say how riveting it was, as always, to, uh, to hear you. Uh, your voice was certainly heard loud and clear, and the, cons <laughs> the concerns you've raised, it's a very, I think, a, a provocative, inspiring, wide-ranging talk, and uh, uh, extremely balanced. I, I just wanted to mention one or two things that struck me. Yeah. Uh, the, you know, like the first part of your talk, mm. I think you flagged several issues of yeah. great concern. And uh, it made me wonder whether the pandemic is going to undo some of the, uh, you know, decades of work that has been done to empower women and yes. improve their position in society. Are we actually yeah. being pushed back? Uh, and, and then in the latter part of your talk, you actually made very concrete suggestions. And you even made a very bold statement that it is the women who's, who are going to pull us out yeah. of this crisis. So uh, my, my first question uh, was really that. Is, and of course, one more thing that I think was really important in what you said mm. was that uh, uh, from top to bottom, you know, we need to hear the voices of women and to, I mean, participatory governance simply means that, uh, uh, you know, as you said, men like these big ticket items and then yeah. women will say, where's a place for children to play? I mean, this, this is, yeah. I think, profound how we ignore, because we are all interested. In fact, when we deal with the ministry also, <laughs> they, say so. they always say, why are you proposing one crore, two crores? Kuch paanso crore ka batao, then yeah. everybody gets excited, you know? Yes, true. The system works that unless you have some big bad item, nobody cares. On the other hand, it's the small is beautiful, as Shumaka said. It's the small and, uh, you know, slow steps that actually bring about a change. And as you said, in the Panchayati Raj system, because of reservation for women, uh, there's going to be, uh, you know, an incremental true difference in the way we uh, do our planning. So my first question, and then I'll, I'll hand it over to the others. Do you think there should also be reservation in Parliament and in other bodies uh, at the state level, as as you do have in some European countries, or do you think that that is uh, like a top-down, uh, enforced uh, sort of politically correct uh, uh, quota system, which which will which will cramp uh, uh, the way democracy works? Um, I think that personally, I feel that reservation, especially in the assemblies is important for women. We now have enough trained women at the panchayat level. And if you open up reservation initially, yes, like the same uh, uh, objection that was there to reservation in the panchayats, that it will be the wives and the daughters and the sisters, etc. Or women from the more elite communities who have access to a certain amount of political influence or money, etc. Or all of that will be the ones who will get in. But there will always be women who have worked their way up, who will get uh, their edge, you know, their foot into the door and will be strong enough and resilient enough to, to battle those first few years, whether it's five or ten in, uh, because Panchayat Reservation has shown us that took 25 years. This is not going to take so long. This will take maybe five to ten years, which is actually nothing in the life of a nation. Um, and you will have a lot more women's voices. But let's also be uh, a little careful here. Not all women will be advocates for other women. They may be advocates for themselves individually, but not always advocates for other women. Human beings uh, today are very wary of competition. And again, this is regardless. This is across the board. So uh, while a reservation is needed uh, to make sure that women's voices are uh, heard more at the decision-making levels, much like we have said that you need to have compulsory a woman on every director and every board, a women director on every board. So now you will see that uh, there is training available for uh, women to be more participative and better uh, performing directors. That will come for parliamentarians too, or uh, women who are assembly MLAs. So I think that 
even if we can't agree on uh, 30% or 33%, we should at least start with 20 to 25%, which is not that much, uh, that much of a big deal. At the moment, I think we have barely 11% women in the in parliament. And this includes people like Jaya Bachchan, etc., who are nominated. Elected women are far fewer. So I'm not, I didn't mention Jaya Bachchan to be controversial. I'm just saying there are many women who are uh, not actually political in that sense, who are members of parliament, which is fine. I mean, if that's a mind school thing because of the work they've done, etc., or if there are people who are nominated and who actually bring up the issues of uh, uh, the people uh, of the sector where they work in, like the lady from West Bank all day to give her credit, even though she's a TMC MP, she actually said that the film world must be given, the government needs to give uh, uh, many things, uh, beginning with pensions and uh, uh, insurance, et cetera, to the poorer people, the spot boys, the, the, the daily wage, wages in the industry. Uh, that, is, that is also a very good thing. Actually, strangely enough, it is the TMC that has the maximum uh, percentage of women MPs that were elected uh, in the last elections to the center. Uh, Mamta made sure of that to give her credit for it. Uh, but uh, I think we will need reservation across the board to be able to you know, bring women at least to 30% in parliament. Ideally, it should be 50%. We are 48% of the population, 49% almost. So ideally, it should be 49, 50%, but that's a long way to go. But you know, there are African countries where the reservation is actually more than 50% and they have done a remarkable job in governance when it comes to social indicators, especially the UN uh, charter that we have been given. Women uh, seem to be better at governance, less corrupt, uh, even harder working, I'm told. Um, uh, definitely more so. Okay, I'm back. I'm sorry, electricity was, uh, I mean, just went for a toss. It, I, electricity got cut. Can you all hear me again? Yes, ma'am. Okay, yeah. fine. So I'm saying that uh, women are supposed to be in many ways better than uh, better at governance. It is true that women um, adapt to training much easier because I think it's in our DNA. We've been told that we have to learn and, you know, we listen to instructions. So uh, when I met uh, women from this particular African country, I was surprised to hear that they actually have statistics. They change uh, what I said, disaggregated um, data that is needed. They change their system to One of you could take over, please, till he comes back on. Uh, no, I went into a patch where yeah, uh, okay, okay, about I, I lost you for a moment. But uh, somebody sent a question here. Ah, hmm. says, uh, uh, thanks, ma'am, for an enlightening and dynamic presentation. But uske baad, I don't see anything else. It was just a compliment. No, no, here, here, it's coming. <laughs> Despite reservations in Panchayat, mm. the active participation of women in politics has not been ensured. Mm. They become sarpanch and get other positions, but the work is mostly done either by the partners or sons. Uh, what should be done to ensure their active participation apart from reservation? This is the question. Apart from reservation, what needs to be done? I think that uh, Lalita ji already told us how women need to be empowered from home, right from childhood. And I think she said one thing which was which really struck me, which is that you have to raise your daughters uh, to believe that everything is possible for them. You can't raise them to 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 think that uh, they have a restricted scope to do well because they are girls. 
I mean, anyhow, go ahead. I just wanted to summarize what you said, but go ahead, please. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Makaran, and thank you for the question. Uh, we need to train women. Uh, the MPs whom you see, or the MLAs, or the panchayat leaders, you see the men. They've been around for donkey's years, for 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years. So they've been trained on the job. Now, women are expected to come in trained. I don't know why, but I think the expectations for women are always greater. Even though probably the more the gender bias, the more the expectation seems to be from women. You need to train them. You need to tell them that in a short time, this is what you need to learn. Uh, for the women who are still allowing, who are just Namke Vaste, uh, we call them Sarpanch Patis, the guys who come and sit. Um, uh, you know, you need to teach, uh, uh, you first, uh, the, the others in that panchayat should be strong enough to say that, no, you keep quiet. It's not your business. You don't have the right, the legal right. They actually don't have the legal right to be able to make decisions on behalf of their wife, unless it's given in writing. And uh, there are laws even there. So that's one thing. The second thing is that the women who have been elected to panchayat, not always only the sarpanches, they need to be trained. Much like educated women like me, etc., at this level are being trained to be responsible and proactive directors or independent directors, as they say, on the boards of public limited companies. So you need to do skills training, a huge amount of skills training for women. You need to teach them to use the internet first. That's one of the most important things. You need to teach them that this is what a budget is, this is what the work is, this is what you can do. Women will ask questions much like men. But the moment a woman asks a question, you are told, Are you don't know anything, go away. You're just a dumb woman, you're just, your pati will do the work. So they give in. But you need to do training over and over again. Uh, you know how often the bureaucracy is trained? When you get into whether it's the Forest Service or the IPS or the IS, IAS especially, IFS, you get retraining. Every job you go to, you're retrained. They have different words for it. I mean, a different nomenclature for it. But every job they go to, they they have they are, sort of they have to go to and through an orientation. We don't do this for our panchayats. We should, especially for the women. So aside from the reservation, I agree there has to be uh, you know skills training. Skilling is not just about making clothes and weaving and cooking and uh, you know the more uh, daily wage uh, sort of jobs. Skilling is as much, if not more, for jobs at the higher level, administrative, bureaucracy, politics. When you go into uh, Rajya Sabha or Lok Sabha, you don't know anything about how parliament works. You learn on the job. Many of us are actually trained. Many of those, I have done some training for them. Uh, we do orientation for some of the women MPs and tell them these are the problems you should be talking about in your constituency. Or you should try and find out about in your constituency. Not always to do only with women, but to do with people in the constituency. Everybody needs training on the job. These people too need training on the job, whatever the job may be. In politics, it has to be about politics. Politics is a very tough, very ruthless, and, <coughs> and if you're an honest person, a very thankless job sometimes. Because there is so much expectation from you. Uh, and it's so much of it is about money. And the system is so corrupt that for an honest politician, it's very, very difficult to navigate the corridors of politics, not just the corridors of power. Today, at the upper level, you will find corruption has decreased. But in the middle and the lower levels of, of the government, it's still very bad. I can tell you this very frankly. Yes, uh, there is change coming in slowly, but like all change, it will take its own time and there's so much resistance to it that it will take place slowly, not very fast. But reservation and training, any woman who's elected, whether it's parliament, whether it's panchayat, whether it's just the village council, uh, like in the northeast, etc., whether it's uh, at the MLA level, you have to be trained. The job I think that training. is a very, very important point. Exactly. The training and retraining. In fact, yes. uh, I would say it's, it's important that it's not just for women, it's for all of us. For everybody. I yes, mean, we all, yes, and, and we are not doing enough of it, you know. No, uh, even the NEP, yeah, NEP has talked about yes. it, but yes. we have to create a society no. which has lifelong learning. If you really want to be a knowledge society, as ancient Bharat was supposed to be, we need lifelong uh, learning. Otherwise, And uh, I'm We've lost get thrown it. out of ah. jobs. 
Yeah. The government is racing to suspend or annul protection laws, including hygiene and safety in workplaces. Mm. And so he's saying, he's saying, then, then what is to be done? How do we protect the jobs of women mm. if the labor protection is being thrown out of the window? That's his question. Whose question? Oh, okay, somebody Dr. asked Dr. A Subramanian. Yeah, Dr. Subramanian. Okay, okay, sorry. One, uh, of, one of our fellows. And it's, it's by the way, it's the Indian it's sort of advanced study. It's not administrative. Sorry. We have sorry, nothing sorry, to do sorry. with administration, thank okay. goodness. But I'm just saying, uh, we are a bunch of academics who usually, okay. I mean, have very little to do with policy. But I think we've been trying to make some amends and trying to get a little more real and, and do work which, which has greater... Uh, bearing on our, uh, you know, uh, social yeah. and uh, poli political and and uh, other concerns, governance concerns. Go, go ahead, go ahead, please. Okay, thank you. Sorry for that mistake. I've noted it. I won't make that mistake again. Uh, no, no, now to Mr. Subramanian, who has asked this question. Um, you know, uh, there are laws regarding women in the workplace, and. Um, if the government is trying to get rid of the laws, uh, uh, in, especially in states, I think UP has done this uh, quite a lot in a couple of other states where they say that uh, there is no bar on hiring and firing, uh, then we need to make sure that women are those who are actually hired, which means that you build their skills, which and again, repeatedly build their skills, not just at one go, which means you make women more employable. One of the problems and one of the complaints from a lot of uh, employers throughout the country is that you have BAs and PhDs and BSCs and MSCs, etc., who are really unemployable. They take Satyam, uh, for, not Satyam, Infosys once said that they give them not six months, uh, they thought six months training on the job would be enough. Many of them need at least 10 to 12 months. And these are people who are already very well educated, already supposed to be very skilled. So you need to ensure that if you want, uh, for example, a woman, agricultural farm labor, let's not look at the upper end, look at the lower end. That woman needs to be trained. It's not enough that she learns on the job. Make sure that there is skills training for uh, daily wages, whatever the training may be. If it is just financial management in a small thing, if she's starting off with a nukad uh, dukan, potikade, as we say in Tamil, right? Make sure that she has the financial skills to be able to make a go of it. Uh, if uh, if she has to do, you know, she doesn't need to do balance sheet balancing and st like, stuff like that, but she does need to do stock management. Many women instinctively know stock management because they've learned how to manage their households. But no, if she needs skills training, give it to her. If she's, if you think that women are going to lose jobs in the formal sector, make sure they have the training. Women are extraordinarily competent. The assumption that if uh, a woman is trained, she will not be able to compete with a man is very wrong. Uh, very often you will find, uh, um, you know, uh, many of these e-commerce companies will tell you that they have more women sitting uh, at uh, helplines than men because women work harder, they take shorter breaks and fewer breaks and they are not as argumentative if they have to do 15, 20, half an hour or more. They won't immediately say, I want, first I want overtime. So a lot of women have a lot of advantages. We need to be able to tap those advantages. We need to be able to skill them, make them employable. And believe me, any employer today understands that what, what is important is productivity. And if productivity is there, then you will find that these risks go down. Nowhere will you get 100% guarantees. But if women are to be on par with men, uh, you give them the same advantages, what we call access, you will very often find that women end up doing better than men. Right, right. Uh, any other questions? Uh, do people want to uh, raise other questions? You can unmute and ask directly. That might be also a good way to interact with uh, Lalita Ji directly. Go ahead. Uh, you can. Uh, I'll. Uh, you can raise your hand if you like, and uh, or or simply uh, unmute your mic and and try to pitch in if you want to. I think I can see most of you. Uh, in the grid view. So if somebody wants to say something, you can, uh, you can pitch in. <clears throat> so Mandeep ji, did you have something to say? Uh, sir, I already typed my question in the chat box. 
and you asked okay but, uh, cases, uh, uh, you can, asked you, okay. can you just read it out uh, I sir you read my question domestic sir domestic violence yeah domestic no, no, violence no. right no yes. no no uh, this was regarding this reservations in panchayats that i all right yeah yeah that's done that's done yes, we did yes, that yes. one already yes 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 somebody they were writing a script and all that i don't know who that was but uh, <laughs> uh, oh that is our dataram ji but uh, for a minute i read it in hindi and i said pata nahi who is abusing us and then i realized <laughs> it's only a script you know uh, so as a pro when you want to say something go ahead So, I just don't get. Sorry, Sunaini, there. Your voice is not clear. Ah, your voice is cut. Ah, I think. Ah, uh, uh, try putting off your camera. Then sometimes it's better. That's right. That's right. Me, I have written a piece of a script where a drunker husband is beating his wife, and the wife curses him. Ah. मुझे कोरोना हो जाए तू चला जाए तेरे मरते समय तेरे सामने यार रिश्तेदार कोई भी ना रहे सिर्फ डेथ सर्टिफिकेट की फाइल रहे और मरने के बाद तेरी मुखाग्नि कोई वर्ड बॉय दे But you know, Professor, the truth is that most women will not say this to their husbands in India. Yes, yes, yes absolutely. Because I'm not saying because absolutely. it's right or wrong. But also because their own prosperity and their own standing in their community is tied to their husbands, we don't yes, get treat yes. single women well in this country. So true. You know, one of the things I so, found interesting about the dialogue, though, is that this Corona Devi has been invoked on the side of the uh, you know abused woman. Yeah. Uh, and usually, you see, many of the Devis they turn angry, uh, and then there's nothing that you can do to. you know escape the wrath i Kamada, remember the yes. yeah story of kanagi in uh, kali kanagi in uh, uh, i think it it's yeah. uh, the great tamil epic uh, you know shilapati karam so, where yeah. all of madurai pumpuhar is destroyed because of the anger of the woman so here i mean it's interesting i don't think corona is is discriminating but it does seem that women are less affected that's what the statistics are they have better resistance men are the ones who are dying of corona in much yeah. higher numbers than women yes. i think at yes. least uh, at least the yes. death rate of men is 20 25% more than that yeah it is it is in india it so is that i, is I one, don't know about throughout the world I think but in india certainly all over the world all over the world yes what from what i have gathered uh so yeah. wonderful uh, well it, does anybody have any questions i don't want to uh hurry you up but uh, otherwise uh, i know that uh, lalita ji's time is extremely precious thank you no 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 for, i was told to find your... so i have no problem but if anybody has questions uh, like can i ask one more that. question sure yeah uh, yeah sumandeep sumandeep ji go ahead dr kaur go ahead yeah uh, so ma'am my question is uh, related to the situation of uh, uh, women who migrated from cities to their home places during the pandemic hmm. so uh, i mean after the pandemic how do we see their situation as compared to men like when they return back to their uh, work places and women return back to the, uh, to their work places so hmm. how it would affect them like would there be some kind of difference when we see uh, uh, how it is affected men and how it is affected women uh, see if you have women who are unmarried women or uh, women older women whose husbands have died etc or have just not got married their um, status will be different from those who are coming back as wives with their families at the moment what is preventing women from returning to work is the fact that transport systems have not yet come back to normal the railways in certain cases has introduced a lot num- a far greater number of of trains than uh, um, were there before for example to delhi and parts of up and gujarat and to andhra pradesh and now i am told not so much tamil nadu as andhra pradesh because labor is going back to those areas so women have uh, but you you can't change a cultural system so fast so it is first the women a uh, men who will go back to work and then probably single women who will go back to work as uh, casual labor 
as maids and cooks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, they are the ones who will get the first chance. Uh, when they go back, well, uh, I'm told one of the biggest things is going to be accommodation. Because everybody is very, very wary about letting anybody into their house who may have had COVID. And the people coming back from the villages are not all going to go and have a COVID test and then come and say, Acha, we have come back to work. They don't have the money. They don't have the access. So uh, this is a problem that I think probably employers may have to pitch in. Now, I don't know how far my suggestion is practical because um, I myself, uh, I mean, if I had, for example, live in uh, this thing, I am very strict. I don't allow them to go to the markets and all yet because I don't want to get infected. I am compromised because of my cancer, et cetera, early. Of course, now I'm fine. But nonetheless, it is, uh, I have what is called comorbidities. And many people do, not just me. So uh, I'm told that the greatest problem they will have is actually finding accommodation to stay. I suppose here again, there has to be citizens associations and government who steps in. Because at, that, at, the, at, the, at the volume that we are talking about, uh, individuals cannot do it. So uh, eventually, uh, I mean, it, this, this, uh, this problem will need to be brought to the attention of state governments and the center. And uh, they will have to deal with that. Because people also want them back. I mean, you know, everybody wants to open up. All businesses have taken a hit. Small, big, medium, doesn't make a micro, doesn't make a difference. So as they want their labor back, you will hear of many uh, people actually flying their labor back in uh, buying them air tickets, etc. But what may be problematic more than even travel is the accommodation. I guess, uh, you know, even accommodation because of economic compulsions, uh, they will slowly start be becoming more uh, easily available. Uh, but there's no surefire uh, remedy for this. The government will have to do whatever it needs to, to ensure that uh, industry and uh, uh, businesses come back on track. Yes, thank you. Uh, Professor Chahal, did you have something to say? I think uh, Professor Chahal wrote me a mail where he talked about the social stigma of uh, the coronavirus. And he, he, yeah. he talks about a society like ours, which is very quick to stigmatize people, you know? Yes, and, yes. And, uh, and uh, he himself is a, a very eminent, uh, what we may call a Dalit Brahmin. He has uh, mm. come from that background, but he's done extremely well. And uh, I'm only quoting him. I'm not, I'm not attributing anything to him. So go ahead, tell us up. Aapko kuch, uh, hai, to please go ahead. The first thing is that I, I had a decision on your using the term Dalit Brahmin for me. Okay. I agree. I actually agree. Sorry, for I Makran, think, but I agree. I, I think no, no, he was... himself used it. That's why I didn't put it. And <laughs> no, actually no. the expression, the expression is by Sharan Kumar Limbare. Okay. And he gave a, he gave a talk on his biography. Yeah. And uh, that is where it came up. But the point is that he he has uh, risen to that status of being a professor and he's doing a certain kind of job. That's how I meant it. Anyhow, go ahead. Go ahead. What are you saying? Go ahead. Uh, sir, thank you. Thanks for uh, your compl <laughs> complimentary remarks about me. And uh, my question, actually, I have put my question in the chat box. So mm. please read it. Okay, okay, hold on. Okay, I didn't see oh, it. Yeah, I'm chat sorry. Box. Chat mm, box may, chat. but now that you have the mic, why don't you just uh, tell us what the question is? Oh, yes, uh, you have rightly stated that women have, have really helped us to fight with the challenges created by yeah, the pandemic yeah, in yeah. rural India. My question is what to do to support and give relief to the common women, particularly working classes? That is Dr. Chahal's question. What relief can be given to uh, the ordinary women of our villages who belong to the working classes and who have been uh, uh, really hit hard by the pandemic? You know, the, one of the first things I said was that we should be able to see that they have child care centers. Um, at the moment, since schools are not open, uh, maybe these schools uh, could be used to... Uh, just one minute. Tell them I'll call back. Sorry. Um, maybe these school areas could be used as, uh, you know, temporarily 
uh, for children to be sent when mothers uh, go back to work. I don't think women are going to go back to work full time immediately in the villages. Uh, agricultural women have been working anyway, so they have found their solutions. I don't mean to sound callous, I'm just putting facts before you all. But for women who have migrated back from the cities to the villages and are going to migrate back, um, they will, uh, they will, the first thing they will need is to be able to have a place where their children can be taken care of. Yes, uh, yes, that's very the, important. The, but the other, the other you, stuff, you know, women do you really manage. find that happening? Anganwadis and all are there, but uh, I don't think there's enough support. Uh, you know, no. you see, even even today, you see migrant women; they have little babies strapped to yeah. them. And they're still working on construction sites. So, yeah, I think in terms of providing, I mean, the crash itself is such a huge. Uh, but I know that good, that well-off companies are doing it. They have daycare facilities right, mm. right in their campuses and in places like Bangalore. And yeah. I know that the government is giving, uh, giving maternity and paternity leave. So I think government employment generally has many more safeguards, you know, compared to the private hire and fire situation. Uh, but mm. uh, this is this is how, as you said. Uh, uh, you know, once you start uh, digging deeper into these issues, then then you just see that uh, uh, there's so much to be done, you know, and we are just scratching the surface, honestly. This is why I said women's voices from top to bottom need to be heard. Precisely, precisely, precisely. Uh, uh, but I think you also said, I mean, the reason I brought in Dr. Chahel, because he wrote to this email, the point is, as you said, nobody uh, wants a corona recovered person yes. also to be around them. Yes, Forget about yes. corona positive. Yes, yes. And this fear, this phobia is going yeah. to affect uh, very vulnerable people. Like, they, see, if I'm a maidservant, I go to five houses, right? And yeah. uh, suddenly I test positive and I lose all my employment. And even if I'm recovered, People are going to they, stigmatize yes, me. Yes. So these True. sorts of uh, now, if you if you're well off, you can afford a live-in uh, help. But mm. for many people, they go to many many houses, yes. three four houses, yes. and then there's so much fear because they say, "Oh, you've come in contact with ten different people, whereas we can't take yeah. a chance." You know. So True. these are issues we have to work on. And uh, you rightly said that one of the most important. Uh, aspects of activism is messaging. You know, the right messaging mm -hmm. will help people get over these fears because Indians, yeah. as you rightly said, it's paradoxical. Now, I'm, I'm in Chandigarh, I'm near the airport now, and people are wandering around without masks. Without masks. And, yeah. and on the other hand, the moment they hear that someone is positive, then they're going to harass those people, you know. Yeah. So this is our paradox that we don't uh, observe, uh, you know, whatever these disciplinary, self-disciplinary, uh, you know, guidelines are. And then the moment we hear someone is contracted, as if it's their fault, it's a yeah. pandemic. We are in a community transmission phase. There's more than... Yeah, this is what I said, that our lack people lack got of this. civic sense. Oh. Exactly, 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 exactly. So I think anyhow, uh, if, are there other questions? Otherwise, I will hand it to uh, Minuji to give a vote of thanks. And uh, I only want to say from my side, you're a great inspiration. And I didn't want to bring in the cancer survivor because I thought, uh, but you, you spoke about it yourself so openly. And uh, we are very proud of you. And we hope that after the pandemic, uh, uh, you know, uh, eases, if not ceases, then your uh, long awaited trip to yes, I was just going to say. Materialize. I was just going to say I'll shamelessly invite myself <laughs> there. Absolutely, no. You you already are invited, but uh, you know because Thank of you. this, and we made, yeah, we made two three plans to call you if you remember. Yes, I and, do. Remember. Uh, you, I, I I remember you're telling me you can't you can't bear these long car trips, you know. Yeah, but, uh, but maybe from from uh, yeah, from but after long four hours. Oh, wonderful. That's, can that's I, can great. I can I add yes, one yes. Sure, yes, sure. Professor Chahal, go ahead, please. Yeah, sir, you, you, you are very, very right in saying that uh, the COVID suspects 
have you know faced uh, yeah. Yeah, social discrimination and many things mm. even in, uh, and i have pointed out the, this uh, this problem in my mail also and mm. you are you are sir you are very right that you have called these people as the you know covid warriors huh? i mm. so actually I, i was also <laughs> when among those or when among them who have faced this problem of social discrimination even okay. uh, even at the hands of my fellow colleagues yes and uh, oh, i i was not i was not a covid patient hmm. i was just on home quarantine ah so i know very often that this happens. Uh, this you know with this bias or this uh, feeling of uh, you know tabo or and even a, so a kind of untouchability which the society is doing with the, these people so this is my submission no you're right absolutely it's very sad and uh, well i was in the united states when the aids uh, uh, you know hiv thing mm. really exploded and uh, you know the amount of messaging that had to go into uh stopping this kind of untouchability yes. as you said so we need to do that the messaging uh, uh you know the media man the message of uh, approach this committee in case you know kuch bhi unko koi bhi takleef ho koi bhi shikayat ho to hai na you can yeah. mention something about that uh good so i will uh, then uh, i don't think the speakers joined us or uh, can someone check with her ritika ji can check ki kya ho raha hai uh see if she can uh join us again and then then we can uh, conclude this i'll also try to message her let me see if i can get through to her थर्ड लिंक चल नहीं रही है ना सेकंड लिंक ही चल रही है राइट थर्ड लिंक दिस थर्ड थर्ड लिंक 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 ओके ओके आई विल जस्ट टेल क्लिक ऑन द थर्ड लिंक यस बट यू आर एब्सुलटली राइट प्रोफेसर चहल दैट हम लोगों के यहाँ कोई एक्सक्यूज कोई बहाना चाहिए है ना किसी को डिस्क्रिमिनेट करने के लिए वेदर इट इज जायज है नाजायज है वी आर सो क्विक टू यू नो सम हाउ टारगेट पीपल आइसोलेट दम वट एवर इट इज यू आर एब्सुलटली राइट एंड नाउ वी हैव वन मोर रीजन हम ये लोग कर हम कर रहे हैं rather than being helpful to one another because dekhiye in any pandemic we can only survive if we all help each other you know and uh, through mutual cooperation understanding uh, and support because lot of people need support you know suppose i am confined to my house i will need somebody's help you know to bring me vegetables whatever so if you are not supportive of each other how can we survive a pandemic you see so i think you're absolutely right and uh, even our health workers our doctors and others are facing so much hostility i know that in gurgaon oh i'm glad lalita ji is back we just wanted to yeah uh, sorry give i you tried a formal... to log in but it said the meeting is not started so i got stuck there anyway okay okay no no not an issue we were just completing that point that how even uh, doctors uh, i know in places uh, in good so called good societies housing yes. societies uh, their neighbors are saying don't come don't come here because you're going to the hospital and getting exposed so here are people who are helping others and uh, we are not supportive of our own doctors you see which is a terrible thing and they are under tremendous stress they work long hours and, and yet uh, their own neighbors are saying that listen don't come back home go stay somewhere else so 
This is the yes. kind of uh, unfortunate, whereas in a pandemic, we really need to help and support each other. And, uh, and uh, only then can we really get out and our social bonds can be strengthened, you know, that uh, instead of creating more divisions and stratifications and uh, differences. Anyhow, I will, I will now hand it over to Dr. Meenu Agarwal to conclude the proceedings with a vote of thanks. And I'll also excuse myself because I really have to, uh, you know, the airport is just next door now, and I, I must uh, excuse myself and thank you all very much. Especially thank you, Lalita Ji. I really enjoyed your, uh, uh, your, you know, your presentation, and uh, there's so many things you said, and you also said them in such a nice way, uh, you know, straight from the heart. That's what I was saying when we got cut off. That both the medium and the message are so important. And as you mentioned, Prime Minister, we have seen here, uh, never before have we uh, seen this combination, uh, you know, of somebody who is really dedicated to transforming our country and who is also such a great communicator. So I think we must uh, ramp up our own, uh, uh, you know, ability to reach out to people. And that can only come, as, as you rightly said, when both the medium and the message are... are uh, Completely tandurust. Okay, thank you all very much, and I excuse myself. Minuji, over to you now. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Professor Parante, for giving me this opportunity. And thank you very much, uh, Lalita Ma'am, for such an insightful presentation. Being a medical doctor and also heading the internal complaint committee of the institute, I observe and I work with all these problems in my day-to-day -day life while dealing with the patient. So you have touched all the aspects of uh, the status and future of women in post-COVID uh, India. So starting from the economic status, like you can't empower women unless they have this economic independence. Because uh, if you have to ask uh, money from some, someone else, from even your basic needs, how can you uh, confront that? So I saw your uh, debate on uh, India economic weakness immune system on one of these TV channels also. And education also, if the women are not educated, they won't know their rights, that they have right to complain. They have right to complain in internal complaints committee for working men, the problems of the working women. The uh, women who are in higher, uh, high paying jobs, they don't have domestic workers to look after their children. And the women who are in low paying jobs, they also have these problems. They bring their children to the workplace. So where to keep those children? So uh, health, health is one of the aspects we have touched very nicely. And Professor Paranj they asked that uh, men are getting more of this coronavirus than women. I think some studies say that it is due to X chromosome. Women have two X chromosomes. So it is still in research state, but they say that due to that, they, it gives them some uh, a bit more uh, immunity. So, and uh, security, one of the major aspects is security. Uh, today, women can't travel alone at night, can't go anywhere alone. So that is a major issue. It is preventing women to come forward and uh, take the same status as men. So thank you once again, ma'am. We look forward to your, uh, to your uh, visit to Shimla. So thank you everyone for attending this uh, presentation. Can you hear me? Yes. I just wanted to say thank you. Yes. Next time yes, I hope to can. be there in person. <laughs> but thank you all very much. You're being very you. flattering to me. I don't deserve so much flattery. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Next time I hope to meet all of you in person. I would love to come there and meet all of you. I, I mean, I love meeting people. So it's always thank nice you. to, you know, make new friends. Thank you very much. Well, so thank you so much. I've just reached the airport, so I'm glad I yeah, stayed so right through yeah, from the beginning. Okay, wonderful. Thank you all so much. Good evening. And stay safe, stay healthy, everybody. Yes, uh, we are talking yes. about uh, Corona, safe, which means that... Stay careful and stay healthy. Exactly. On that note, thank you all. Bye-bye.